Uh, this is the first lecture in BI150 on the neuroscience of disease. And most of the lectures <clears throat> from now on will be on that topic. And Ralph and I figure you have a pretty good background in elementary and fundamental neuroscience. And so now it's fun to apply that knowledge to diseases that you might see in your friends. Um, we're going to talk about two neurodegenerative diseases today. Next time we will talk about diseases of emotion and uh, Ralph will be talking two lectures next week actually he'll be talking about emotion and about uh, other and uh, I will come and talk with you about schizophrenia as well. So um, the two diseases that we're going to discuss today will be Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. This is Michael J. Fox, who has suffered from Parkinson's disease for many years, the actor. The two diseases, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, are the most common neurodegenerative diseases in our society. We are going to follow a general description for all of the neural diseases. We'll talk about the clinical description, about the genetics, at least what we know about the genetics. The pathophysiology, patho means sick, physiology means how things function. So how the disease gets started based on what we know about the fundamental problems. Biomarkers easily accessible, biochemical, or functioning, blood tests, or other aspects that will allow us to give a quick summary of a disease so that we can follow both the time course of the disease and the therapy, as well as animal models. Uh, there's this interesting concept called a heterozygote advantage. And I won't say much about the heterozygote advantage until we get to one of the psychiatric diseases, bipolar. We'll talk about that in greater detail. And then about therapeutic approaches. So first off is Alzheimer's. Now we have a lot to cover today. I hope we can get through it. But uh, the typical case of Alzheimer's, all right, now here's a, the usual question. Who first described Alzheimer's disease? Okay, so uh, Alzheimer's disease usually begins with a rather pure impairment of a person's ability to think and his cognitive ability. Um, <clears throat> now, as I say to my friends my age, mild cognitive impairment does not always need, lead to a dementia, to a more severe case of Alzheimer's or other dementia. Uh, but there is a progression. Um, first, the only symptom is forgetfulness, and people may have trouble remembering recent events, activities, names of familiar people or things. Uh, maybe they can't do simple math problems. Uh, did I already say that they repeat themselves every few minutes in conversation? No, okay. In the middle stages of Alzheimer's, uh, People forget how to do simple tasks, brushing their teeth, combing their hair. They can no longer think clearly. They begin to have problems speaking. Uh, third stage, Alzheimer's patients actually may become aggressive or anxious because they are realizing that they have lost so much. They begin to wander away from home and they eventually need total care. Now, there is a scale called the mini mental status exam which can be administered in a few minutes by either a psychologist or a neurologist or a psychiatrist. And uh, the mini mental status exam uh, says, uh, asks, well, the, uh, the one of the toughest is please count back from 100 by seven. And then there are the simple questions like who's president, what day of the week is it, when were you born? There are a total of 30 questions. Uh, everybody in this room would score 30. Uh, sometime below 25 begin the symptoms and after a while patients uh, score very poorly on the mini mental status exam. 
so it is, as we say, the most common neurodegenerative disease. And the number of people in age groups are given here. Uh, Alzheimer's is not a normal part of aging. And so you cannot say about a person, uh, well, uh, quite normal to have Alzheimer's at his or her age. Uh, late onset sporadic Alzheimer's occurs, and this is by far the most common late in life, no obvious inheritance. But we'll talk about some risk factor genes that do interact with each other. In fact, the most common risk factor gene to date <coughs> remains a gene that makes one form of apolipoprotein E, uh, which is a carrier for lipoproteins in the blood. Uh, so one uh, polymorphism in APOE4 is, in APOE is called APOE4, roughly 16%. And where, there, where a person has one copy of the gene, the, uh, uh, the probability of getting Alzheimer's is elevated. Two copies of the gene, very severely Alzheimer's, uh, elevated. Uh, familial Alzheimer's, which leads almost invariably to Alzheimer's, uh, is much rarer. It starts at age 30 to 60, so much earlier. The typical hallmark of Alzheimer's pathology are the plaques and tangles in the brain. So here are these amyloid plaques. They contain a large amount of a very famous 42 amino acid peptide called beta amyloid or A beta 42. Now, this is not the alpha 4 beta 2 uh, nicotinic receptor. It is called A beta, and it's 42 um, uh, amino acids long. And uh, it may very well be that beta amyloid is the initial cause of the pathophysiology that leads to dementia. Uh, amyloid plaques probably contribute to the later stages. So the plaques are not what's doing the damage. It may be the beta amyloid itself. Then there are also neurofibrillary tangles that have a lot of cytoskeletal proteins, especially the microtubule associated protein TAU or TAU as most people call it. So in these tangles, there are uh, lots of phosphorylated proteins and these two could cause aggregation and precipitation. So it is important to realize that these plaques and tangles, although they are by far the most visible aspect of the disease, are probably not in the causal progression of the disease. They come much later. And in general, people with Alzheimer's have reduced brain volume, especially in regions that we've discussed, the endorhinal cortex and the hippocampus. Um, so what is going on with Alzheimer's? Well, we don't know, but here is amyloid precursor protein, APP. There are mutations associated with familial Alzheimer's disease. Now, APP is amyloid precursor. These familial Familial Alzheimer's is rather rare. Uh, there are the presenel. There is also in this complex a protein called presenilin one, and as we're going to see, presenilin one is itself a component of a protein called gamma secretase. So all of these mutations in presenilin one or in APP are associated with familial Alzheimer's disease. In addition to the beta amyloid plaques, there are the tau apathies as well, and these are mutations in tau. Uh, these typically do not lead to a pure Alzheimer's. They cause frontotemporal dementia with Parkinsonism. And uh, apparently within the last week, uh, the comedian, named who killed himself, Williams, not Brian Williams. 
Robin Williams, thank you, um, was revealed to have been suffering from a form of frontotemporal dementia. And it is thought that this may have um, contributed to his suicide. Uh, so, how does all of this work? Well, here is the amyloid precur precursor protein, APP. Uh, A beta 40 and 42 are thought to be proteolytic products. So, A beta, APP, has this long extracellular region, has a little bit of a stub of a cytoplasmic region, and the transmembrane domain. Within this stub region, there are several sites for proteolytic uh, cuts, and so these are called alpha, beta, and gamma secretase. And then there are also some domains out here that are associated with uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so it is thought that overproduced A beta and A beta 42 eventually arises because an altered ratio of proteolytic cleavages. And so the A alpha, beta, and gamma proteolytic cleavages. And in fact, all of the known genetic risk factors proposing to true Alzheimer's disease do increase the accumulation of A beta peptides. And so there are APP mutations themselves on chromosome 21. There's the APOE4 polymorphism, which we talked about already on chromosome 19, which also seems to increase the density of A beta plaques. There are mutations in presenilin 1 and presenilin 2, which increases the production of A beta 42. And there is a recently um, discovered protein called TRIM2, which increases the density of A beta plaques. And I believe there is a population in Iceland that has a mutation of TRIM4, of TRIM2, and is actually protected against Parkinson's, oh, sorry, against Alzheimer's. So one needs to understand that the amyloid hypothesis has indeed evolved over the years, and also different scientists have different takes on the amyloid hypothesis. So it was thought originally that these deposits were pathogenic, but it's now thought that A beta, which eventually causes the deposits, uh, also microaggregates or soluble A beta oligomers are the neurotoxic species. And so it's important to realize that although many people publish papers saying, ah, I find that when I overexpress A beta, this molecule is affected, that molecule is affected, this one goes up, this one goes down. There is no clear single target for A beta. Uh, however, soluble oligomers, as we say, um, do apparently um, cause. Uh, for, which range from 40 to 42 peptides, do appear to interact with other proteins. And they are toxic to neurons. It may very well be that the 12 mer is the most significant toxic form, but that changes year by year. And one of the more interesting hypotheses, uh, also which holds for uh, Parkinson's disease is that misfolded alpha A beta 42 may actually act like a prion. Uh, if it develops in one cell, it may spread to another cell. A, a prion is a protein that seems to be infectious rather than DNA that seems to be infectious. So, what on earth is A beta, is APP there for? What on earth is presenilin? Therefore, it may very well be that the normal function of the secretase and of presenilin, which is part of the secretase, is to proteolize um, notch. And we learned about notch and delta in signaling. And the proteolysis of APP may be a side effect.
that also gets proteolized. So there is in the core gamma secretase complex, there is presenilin, either number one or two, another protein that very we know a little bit about, another one that we know little about, and yet a third one. So there's this complex of proteins called the gamma secretase. And it may be absolutely accidental that it cleaves APP, but it almost certainly cleaves notch. So what are the general cellular processes? Well, here we get into the term for the first time, protein homeostasis or proteostasis. proteostasis. And here we're going to spend a lot of time talking about misfolded proteins today. Uh, and they are indeed a major and increasing theme in neurodegenerative disease. Um, my lab is interested in them. Uh, typically, uh, when misfolded proteins accumulate, they do so in the endoplasmic reticulum, and this causes endoplasmic reticulum stress and a phenomenon called the unfolded protein response in which the cell responds homeostatically to the presence of lots of unfolded proteins in the ER. Now, <clears throat> ordinarily, the cell has mechanisms that overcome that, and we'll see a beautiful graph of that in a few slides. But if the unfolded protein response goes on too long, it becomes apoptotic, that is, cells begin to die. Um, then there is also the usual hypothesis having to do with calcium, which is that excitotoxicity occurs because the cell is stimulated too much, because its channels are open too much, calcium accumulates and eventually overwhelms the cell's ability to pump it out. And this allows various metabolites to accumulate in wrong compartments. And uh, calcium also activates transduction systems, overactivates enzymes, and this causes necrosis of the cell, the cell dies. So there are these two general hypotheses in which an insult can be caused either by misfolded proteins or the somewhat older uh, hypothesis in which hyperexcitability, excitotoxicity causes cell death. And both may be operative. Uh, here's a, a, we're harking back now to our lecture on LTP and on learning and memory. Uh, here's an example a very specific example of how the beginning stage of Alzheimer's may be interfering with cognitive processes. And so this is um, <clears throat> a beta injected into a slice of the hippocampus and people are monitoring long-term potentiation. So here is a uh, cell line that has been engineered to express A beta. So it's secreting A beta into the medium. One takes the medium from that cell line, conditioned medium from this petri dish, this culture dish over here, and one puts it onto the slice that is being assessed for LTP. So the conditioned medium containing A beta oligomers decreases LTP but the conditioned medium from another cell line next door that's also secreting lots of stuff but has not been infected with a beta and is therefore not secreting a beta doesn't have this effect. So this is wild type CM conditioned medium. And there are a couple of other controls in the lower panel having to do with antibodies against a beta. So this is a highly specific and well-controlled experiment showing that too much A beta can indeed interfere with a model for a cognitive process. So what are animal models for Alzheimer's? Probably the best animal models are mice that overexpress APP, amyloid precursor protein, especially mice that overexpress APP with Alzheimer's disease associated uh, mutations point mutations. Now, the question becomes, well, what about biomarkers for Alzheimer's? I have told you about the mini mental status exam, the neurological slash psyche, psychiatric exam. Uh, and that is usually quite accurate in diagnosing dementia. 
but really for Alzheimer's, only an autopsy uh, is the right way to do it. And only an autopsy shows decrease in the brain areas such as the basal forebrain, the hippocampus, and the entorhinal cortex. So can you come up with a biomarker? Well, so there are various people are trying to do proteomics and metabolomics on cerebrospinal fluid, on the fluid in the ventricles, hoping to find a pattern that distinguishes a patient with Alzheimer's disease that would be much easier and more quantitative than waiting till autopsy, obviously, might not be easier than a mini mental status exam, but it's more objective. And then there are getting to be PET markers uh, for um, APP deposits. Here is one of them. Uh, it's called fluor beta peer. Beta obviously is for beta amyloid. And this very careful paragraph which you can read yourself, says, OK, we have FDA approval to give this PET test. Uh, and there are words like inconsistent with the neuropathological analysis of AD. So if there's a negative scan, that's inconsistent. If there is a positive scan, like this one here, then moderate to frequent neuritic plaques, but not an absolute proof of Alzheimer's, uh, other types of neurologic conditions, as well as older people with normal function. function. And so this is a way of hemming, hemming and hawing around the fact that there is no biomarker, there is no good imaging procedure for Alzheimer's. Uh, we won't discuss heterozygote advantage yet. Uh, what about therapeutic approaches to Alzheimer's? Really, uh, there are essentially no good therapeutic approaches. Uh, basal forebrain cholinergic neurons are actually early uh, death in Alzheimer's. And so they produce acetylcholine. And so the idea is let's make their remaining acetylcholine last longer and be more protective by using a cholinesterase inhibitor. You remember that acetylcholinesterase is broken down at the nerve muscle synapse by an enzyme acetylcholinesterase. And so there are some brain penetrant acetylcholinesterases. The three that are on the market most prevalent now have these, um, uh, these trivial names, and you will probably know them by their, um, by their trademarks. A newer one, uh, and, and so it's not, these work a little bit. They may delay symptoms by a couple of months. Uh, then there are some inhibitors of NMDA receptors on the market. The idea, as you all know, is that NMDA receptors permeate calcium. And so if you want to stop excitotoxicity, you might stop the uh, flow through NMDA receptors. And this is presumably the way the NMDA receptor blockers work. But inhibitors of beta secretase, which ought to be the answer, have pretty much either failed in the clinic uh, or are still in development. And then there are gamma secretase inhibitors, which have failed. Uh, so there's a gamma secretase inhibitor, which is supposed to spare the notch system and block APP selectively. Uh, they haven't yet succeeded. How about antibodies against beta APP or amyloid beta? So here, biotech companies, including ones that we know well, such as uh, uh, Genentech and Amgen, have tried very hard to make antibodies against either beta APP or amyloid beta. And these have not yet panned out either. So we have a problem. Uh, any questions about Alzheimer's? Okay, let's move on now to Parkinson's, which is the second most prevalent neurodegenerative disease. So we have the usual um, outline that we're going to apply to this disease. Uh, so James Parkinson was 
something like a dentist in 1870 in 1817 and he observed these pa these people in London uh, during his daily walks he found six of them uh, he called it paralysis agitans agitated paralysis um, so I'm going to show you a video a YouTube video of a person who I believe is a professor of neurology, but I have not been able to track down this person's name. Uh, he does an excellent... Um... This gate is the gate that is a hypokinetic gate. Um, the prototype uh, is Parkinson's, um, a Parkinsonian type of gate in which the patient will have... This gate is the gate that this gate is the gate that is a hypokinetic gate. Um, the prototype uh, is Parkinson's, um, a Parkinsonian type of gate, in which the patient will have a posture which will be stooped over, being forward, and then will have difficulty as far as initiating gait. When the gait is initiated, there are small steps. Oftentimes, there's a, there's a tremor associated with this. There's and as the gait progresses, there may be a picking up of speed, or what's called a fenestrated gait. And then in turning, instead of having a normal turning, the patient will turn on block, which means they'll turn almost as a statue moving around and then again having difficulty starting and the marsh petty paw. Starbucks and watch people with that description walk by. Sometimes at the red door, we see people walking around campus with uh, such a description also. Uh, what is not shown on this video are the small motor movements. The most common is a pill rolling movement where a person just has his fingers together and does this for a large amount of time. And again, also a little bit of a shaking in the hands. Uh, however, one rarely sees this full-blown because most Parkinson's patients have either been, have had uh, electrical implants, deep brain stimulation, which we will discuss later in the lecture, or are medicated with L-DOPA or another uh, drug. But it's very tricky to get a patient medicated correctly and sometimes over medication occurs and uh, the easiest you notice that the actor was leaning forward an over medicated Parkinson's patient actually leans too far back and I have often helped Parkinson's patients stand upright. Um, dopamine the dopaminergic neurons in the brain here is a sagittal view of a human brain. As you know, the dopaminergic neurons in the human brain uh, die in Parkinson's disease. Uh, as, as I'm going to tell you, you probably don't know, that dopaminergic neurons in the human brain exp um, project to all regions of the brain. So each neuron has a massive amount of axon releases lots of neurotransmitter, has to work very hard to keep this axon up. In a mouse, I've showed, now this is a coronal section through a mouse brain, stained with tyrosine hydroxylase, which is the enzyme that makes dopamine. And so I've told you about the handlebar mustache in the brain, that is the set of neurons which make dopamine and the Handlebars are the substantia nigra, 
in fact, the substantia nigra pars compacta, because the neurons are fairly close together, and it is the handlebars which degenerate in Parkinson's disease. The upper lip of the handlebar mustache is the ventral tegmental area, still dopaminergic neurons, but they are responsible for a sense of pleasure. We'll get back to this concept in a few slides. Um, one, we're going to use this schematic view, which comes from a nice book by Eric Nessler, Steve Hyman, and Rob Malenka, of the relations between the basal ganglia and the rest of the brain. So the key here is that <clears throat> there are some excitatory neurons, especially high up in the cerebral cortex, and also in the subthalamic nucleus. Well, the subthalamic nucleus, it won't surprise you, is below the thalamus. Well, here's the thalamus, the subthalamic nucleus is below it. And in the basal ganglia, there are lots of GABAergic neurons. So in order to understand the feedback loop that goes wrong in Parkinson's disease, we actually have to do lots of sign inversions. And sometimes it's really unclear how to do those sign inversions. To make things even more challenging, the striatum, which has these large neurons called the medium spiny neurons, has two types. In fact, those two types of neurons and these two projections were discovered by Malin DeLong, who wrote the chapter, I think it's chapter 43 in Candel. So there is the direct projection from the striatum back to the substantia, uh, substantia nigra pars reticulata, which is not dopaminergic, but that feeds to the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is dopaminergic. And then there's an indirect, which has one more synapse. So the signs actually do change. But if you look carefully, this guy has a negative. Um, let's see now. I hope I've got it right. This guy is negative to here. This guy is negative, positive, positive. Yeah, this guy is positive to here. So in fact, uh, oh, but this is a change sign again. So this is a positive, and this is also a positive. So in both cases, the striatum feeds back in a positive way to the substantia nigra pars compacta. The two types of substantia nigra neurons actually have different dopamine receptors on them. One is coupled to GI, the inhibitory uh, G coupled uh, the inhibitory G protein, and the other to GS, the stimulatory G protein. So even at the level of the substantia nigra, the dopaminergic projections to the striatum, we have lots of diversity. In the early stage of Parkinson's, people do lose individual dopaminergic neurons, but it may very well be that the remaining dopaminergic neurons sprout, increase their projections so that the symptoms in early stages of losing Parkinson's disease are not so obvious. And there are various statements that neurologists like to say that Parkinson's does not become evident until people have lost 80% of their neurons. These days, you can do a better diagnosis of early stage Parkinson's. So now people say that you begin to note Parkinson's when the patient has only lost 50% of his dopaminergic neurons. <clears throat> and again, as with Alzheimer's, there are inclusion bodies, there are deposits of poorly folded proteins in the cell. This one is called a Lewy body. I won't tell you who discovered the Lewy body. Um, and they occur in dopaminergic neurons primarily. They, uh, but they also occur in some other diseases. And so there is a disease called dementia with Lewy bodies. Parkinson's doesn't begin with a dementia. It begins as a movement disorder, as the YouTube video demonstrated. But there are other signs in early, early adjuncts of Parkinson's disease. One of the most interesting is that typically 20 years before a patient manifests clinically obvious Parkinson's disease, that patient has constipation. Now, 
I hasten to add to audiences my age that constipation is not a predictor of Parkinson's disease. Uh, retrospectively, you can see it, but lots of people uh, have constipation and do not develop Parkinson's. Uh, and sure enough, in the biopsy of the intestine, uh, there are Lewy bodies in the neurons of the intestinal wall, and there are indeed dopaminergic neurons in the intestine, and these dopaminergic neurons do seem to degenerate. Uh, but there is a famous neuroanatomist called Brock who looked at lots of brains, and uh, lots of places in the brain show Lewy bodies before dopaminergic neurons show Lewy bodies, particularly those with long axons. But the other places with long axons don't seem to show symptoms. Another dramatic effect in early stage Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, sorry, is sleep disorders, especially rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. Also, patients in early stage Parkinson's seem to have trouble smelling. Later stage Parkinson's patients uh, clearly have in many cases, depression, and then in the latest stages of Parkinson's, uh, there is also some dementia many times. And so Parkinson's is by no means a pure loss of dopaminergic neurons. There is a degeneration which pervades eventually the entire brain. So genetics. Uh, there are about 16 genes associated with Parkinson's disease. Together, they all account for perhaps 10% of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in some societies, one or another of these diseases predominate. Uh, typically, the familial Parkinson's disease uh, occurs a bit earlier, 30s to 50s. Um, Sergey Brin carries one of these mutations, and he has been convincing 23 and the founder of Google. He has been convincing 23andMe, which is one of these genotyping companies, to get lots of genotypes from Parkinson's patients. So there are various proteins involved uh, that contribute to, uh, that, that are very highly associated with Parkinson's. The pattern of inheritance is different. Autosomal dominant means that one copy of the gene will cause the disease. Autosomal recessive means that one needs to have two. And the more is known about the early ones than the later ones. Certainly the most famous of the genes are alpha-synuclein and Parkin. Alpha-synuclein is an intrinsically disordered protein that seems to be involved in membrane fusion among various organelles and probably in transmitter release in the membrane fusion associated with transmitter release. Parkin, entirely different function, it is an E3 ubiquitin ligase involved in uh, clearing misfolded proteins or others marked for removable. So, then there's LARC2, which is a kinase. LARC2 seems to be most apparent in Middle Eastern um, families. And so among the 10% of patients, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, who have a familial Parkinson's, there's a surprisingly large number of LARC2 mutations. Any questions? So, what is the pathophysiology of Parkinson's? Well, one has to say right off that most of the causes are unexplained. Dopaminergic neurons have this particular problem in that they make this transmitter, dopamine, with two adjacent hydroxyl groups. It is a catechol amine. This is a catechol, it's a catechol amine, and these can very easily be oxidized. And so the breakdown products of uh, dopamine are undoubtedly a cause of Parkinson's disease. There are some very nice studies out of UCLA looking at <clears throat> uh, 
inhabitants of the Central Valley, uh, Valley of California and correlating increases in Parkinson's disease with the amount of pesticides spraying. And so it's thought that the pesticides become taken up into dopaminergic neurons and become toxic. Uh, then there is, of course, the frozen addict story. This happened about 30 years ago. Uh, in the Bay Area, people started making a synthetic heroin using a bad formula. This was obviously uh, illegal. Uh, this synthetic derivative of heroin was highly toxic, but was taken up by the dopamine transporter which is expressed only in dopaminergic neurons and is the target for many drugs of abuse and of therapy, including ADD medications. So this toxin taken up by the, this protoxin taken up by the dopamine transporter was converted into, into a toxin in the dopaminergic neurons and killed virtually all of the dopaminergic neurons. Another death of dopaminergic neurons occurred during the worldwide encephalitis pandemic of, 19, of 1918. Uh, and some of the people in this pandemic, pandemic means epidemic all over the world, had selective death, presumably because of autoimmune reactions to their dopaminergic neurons. And um, when the late Oliver Sacks was still a medical student, he spent some time in a, um, a hospital, so this was in the late 60s, mid 60s in New York, found many patients who still had virtually complete paralysis due to this loss of dopaminergic neurons. And at the time, L-DOPA was just beginning to be approved. And his first book, Awakenings, was about the patients who transiently were remarkably benefited by L-DOPA. Okay. So, alpha synuclein with these mutations. So, what does it do? Oh, how embarrassing. We really do not know what alpha synuclein does. But it also for Alzheimer's, one of the earliest aggregation products uh, may be the one that is most toxic in um, Parkinson's disease, and the Lewy body may be a very late stage of that. One of the other early factors may be improper fission and fusion of mitochondria, and David Chan here at Caltech is <coughs> one of the experts on that topic. Okay, so... What about these protein folding problems? I'm reproducing here a figure from Candel, but much larger so that you can see some of the topics. So one of the neurodegenerative diseases is an expanded triplet repeat. We're not going to talk about that. Another is a missense mutation in a gene. We've seen these examples in Parkinson's and earlier today in Alzheimer's. Uh, ALS, we are not going to discuss at all, just no time. But in general, it is thought that the protein that's made has an incorrect conformation. And this incorrect conformation uh, persists and can't be cleared from the cell and may engage in um, incorrect protein-protein interactions or protein-nucleic acid interactions. Uh, in some cases, the cell can mount a defense, bringing in chaperones, the unfolded protein response, the ubiquitin proteasome system. But in many cases, because this misfolded protein persists, goes on for a long time, uh, ultimately the misfolded protein begins to alter gene expression, alter mitochondrial function, alter synapses begins to induce apoptosis, and also causes inflammation. Axonal transport is a very delicate function of neurons, especially of neurons with long axons. And so this can easily be deranged. And so the picture in Candel shows in the late stages of a neurodegenerative disease, obvious morphological changes, 
and eventually cell death. We'll come back to this picture in a few minutes when we discuss nicotine. There are animal models for Parkinson's. Among the favorite animal models are mice treated with toxins. I think we will talk about that. But Drosophila that overexpress various proteins uh, that are associated with human Parkinson's disease are also fruitful and handy. Uh, there are a few dopaminergic neurons in Drosophila, and when one overexpresses synuclein in these dopaminergic neurons, these dopaminergic neurons die preferentially. Other neurons do not, but the dopaminergic neurons do. And in fact, these mice, uh, sorry, these Drosophila have a kind of movement disorder. Normal Drosophila can climb very well, but Drosophila overexpressing certain synuclein mutants uh, show a much poorer climbing ability. And Professor Bruce Hay here at Caltech has studied this along with um, Professor Yao at UCLA. Mingguao, sorry. Okay, more models for Parkinson's disease. Toxin-treated mice, rats, and monkeys, in which there are insults to these delicate dopaminergic neurons. Mice with altered specific genes. Even more reduced models, yeast, that have synuclein mutations. Uh, the current emphasis on human embryonic stem cells and on induced pluripotent stem cells uh, have given rise to the idea that you could do a disease in a dish. You could take a human neuron, a human stem cell, differentiate it to become a dopaminergic cell, and ask the consequences uh, of that, uh, especially of a mutant that you can either induce or find in a patient for the function of that cell. There are some technical issues associated with uh, making embryonic stem cells. As we pointed out, there is the handlebar and the upper lip. These are two different types of dopaminergic neurons. The handlebars degenerate, the upper lip does not. The handlebars are the substantia nigra pars compacta. The upper lip is the ventral tegmental area. And we don't yet know how to differentiate neurons into the one or the other. Biomarkers. Again, there is uh, probably the experienced neurologist carries the day. There's no blood test. The best indication of early stage Parkinson's is responsiveness to L-DOPA. We'll talk about L-DOPA in a while. Then there is also an imaging drug. It is a high affinity dopamine transporter ligand. When, neuro when dopaminergic neurons die, the dopamine transporter dies with them. So there are lots of movement disorders, essential tremor, etc. A good neurologist can tell them apart, but imaging of dopaminergic neurons can also help. And as usual, one gives a sort of a mealy mouth statement about confirmatory tests, monitoring disease progression. That's probably a good use. OK, heterozygote advantage, none known. Therapeutic approaches. Well, the therapeutic approach that is most commonly used now is L-DOPA. And L-DOPA is a precursor to dopamine. Uh, however, dopamine does not cross the blood-brain barrier. L-DOPA does cross the blood-brain barrier. It is a Twitter ion. It's uncharged. Here, it's an amino acid. Uh, it permeates into the brain probably via a transporter in peripheral tissue. Now, there are also enzymes in tissue that will catabolize, will break down L-DOPA. And so it's also used with a compound called carbidopa, which inhibits the decarboxylase that would otherwise break down L-DOPA before it gets to the brain. Sometimes people add a D2 receptor agonist. Remember, dopamine receptors are D1, D2. The D2 receptor has a rather higher affinity, so you can increase it with a D2 receptor agonist. And uh, we'll talk about dyskinesias uh, in a moment. Obviously, L-DOPA is effective only as long as 
you have dopaminergic neurons in the patient. These dopaminergic neurons can take up and secrete uh, dopamine. Uh, and when those dopaminergic neurons become too few, then the L-dopa starts not working very well. But there are other side effects. There are other reasons why L-dopa is not a great drug. There are side effects which are called, called, called dyskinesias, literally bad movements. And they are very common in people who have used L-dopa for many years. And so, in fact, most of the Parkinson's patients that one sees have the L-dopa induced dyskinesias, writhing and quick movements. And you can see TV appearances of medicated Parkinson's patients who do that. Uh, why and how L-dopa causes these dyskinesias is not known. I have a theory, uh, but most people think of other reasons. Uh, and then other effects of L-dopa are poor sleep, hallucinations, in some cases psychotic symptoms, although that often comes from the D2 agonist, very and simple confusion. Now, one of the remarkable aspects of this dyskinesia is that there's an on and an off phenomenon. People go from having the dyskinesia to not having them during the course of the day. And really, they occur even after a person has stopped taking the L-dopa. So this is really a mystery. Uh, other drugs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, maybe to stop production of toxin, muscarinic antagonists, these were actually the first drugs used for Parkinson's. Amantadine, which blocks NMDA receptors like memantine, maybe this reduces excited toxicity. Mitochondrial stabilizers and adenosine receptor antagonists, we don't understand how they work but they seem to give a little bit of symptomatic relief. Now, deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's. I'm going to go over by about five minutes today. Uh, there is this feedback loop involving the positive and the negative um, projections in the basal ganglia. And so it has been thought for a while, let's interrupt the feedback loop. And in fact, a favorite way to interrupt the feedback loop originally was to lesion one of the nuclei in the basal ganglia called the globus pallidus, pars externa. Just destroy it. Now, in order to make sure that people were lesioning correctly, they put electrodes on their wires that they were going to use to pass a lot of current and recorded from neurons and then stimulated those neurons to make sure that they were getting to the right place. And lo and behold, it turned out, of course, that simply stimulating neurons in the right place, not lesioning neurons, also quieted down the tremors of Parkinson's disease. And so that's where deep brain stimulation uh, came to the fore. It's been around now for almost 20 years, and it obviously involves an invasive surgery. You have to put wands with electrodes deep inside the brain, and so the question is, how does deep brain stimulation work? Does it work by activating neurons, by silencing them? And many people think that silencing is the answer because the stimulation frequencies that work are around 160 hertz, too frequent to silence neurons reliably, possibly enough to depolarize them uh, and therefore inactivate them. And the other possibility is that actually they're not working on the neurons themselves but on the axons passing through. Uh, deep brain stimulation is remarkably effective. Uh, I'm going to show you a video. Okay, thank you. That comes from a German clinic. Uh, probably almost Dann 20 years old. Würde ich Sie bitten, die Hand immer ganz zu öffnen und wieder zu schließen. Immer okay, so the um, neurologist okay, is instructing the patient to open and close her um, hands. This patient has a deep brain Dann stimulator. Würde ich Sie bitten, die Hand off. immer ganz zu öffnen und wieder zu schließen. Okay, now open immer it up. diese Bewegung, ganz öffnen she can do und that schließen. Really well. So schnell wie Sie das Tremor können. Doing that not very well mm -hmm. now. Okay. 
Okay, und mit der anderen Hand Now the other hand please. immer ganz öffnen und wieder schießen. Uh, can, ja, bit. genau. Und so schnell aufstehen lassen. Mm -hmm. Ja, ja, ich gehe nur. Okay, versuchen Sie noch mal. Ich werde es ja eben noch gleich hinlegen. Ja, ich noch Ich werde es ja eben noch gleich hinlegen. Ich werde es ja eben noch es auch nicht? Versuchen Sie es mal. Ich habe sie schon. Okay. Ich habe auch die Lüge gesagt, ich bin gefragt. Ja, das verhält sich so, aber ich kann hier das für sich umschauen und ausrichten. So, jetzt, in ein paar Momenten, der Neurologist wird die Deep-Brain-Stimulator auf die Deep-Brain-Stimulator auf die Deep-Brain-Stimulator. Vielleicht nicht so da vorne ein bisschen vorsichtig sein, wenn ich noch die Seite mal wechseln, wenn es geht. So, keine Sorge, ich hab's auch bekommen. Dann laufen wir wieder zum Stuhl zurück, ne? Okay, yes, slowly bringing her back to her chair. Okay. Now she's using the magnetic switch to turn on the stimulation. Schaffst du das, Markus? And in increasing the amount of current that he puts through it. Und in... And she's got bilateral stimulation. möglichst weit aufmachen und wieder zusammen und so schnell wie es geht aber immer ganz aufmachen und mal mit der linken Hand bitte immer ganz aufmachen ganz aufmachen Ganz öffnen und wieder schließen. Und mal mit der rechten Hand ganz aufmachen und wieder schließen. Immer wieder ganz aufmachen. Und wieder schließen. Verschränken Sie bitte die Arme vor der Brust und stehen auf. Ja, wunderbar. Okay, that's fairly dramatic, but I do want you to understand that Parkinson's patients do have on and off periods and sometimes during their normal periods they're almost that good. Nonetheless this is really quite a remarkable therapy. What you'd really like to do though is to intervene in early stage Parkinson's. As soon as a patient has been uh, identified with early stage Parkinson's uh, even though some degeneration has already occurred. And so how do we do that? Uh, so the question is whether deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's actually delays degeneration. There are a couple of papers suggesting that it does. Professor Viviana Gradinaro here at Caltech is very interested in that topic. And uh, she also has one of the early papers, one of the very key papers on optogenetic stimulation as a substitute for deep brain stimulation in a mouse model for Parkinson's. Now, smokers get less Parkinson's disease. More precisely, in retrospective epidemiological studies, there's an inverse correlation between a person's history of smoking and his history of Parkinson's disease. More than 50 clinical studies show this over a period of 50 years. 
So the question is, is this causality? Does tobacco use depend, protect against Parkinson's or is it inverse causality? Do Parkinson's patients use less tobacco? Now remember, the, the handlebar mustache, there's the substantia nigra, movement degenerates, and the DTA, the upper lip pleasure, both activated by nicotine. In humans, there's a little bit of a crossover between these two organs. And so it's possible that the substantia nigra encodes some pleasure. So when the de substantia nigra degenerates, stops producing dopamine in response to nicotine, maybe patients stop smoking. They certainly do. Maybe that's enough to cause the inverse correlation, which is, has also been uh, uh, ascribed to causality. But animal models show that nicotine itself probably is part of the neuroprotective action because you can do lesions of rodents and monkeys and nicotine protects. And this protection in a sort of a hokey paper, uh, alpha-4 nicotinic receptor knockouts don't have this protection. So we need additional data. And one of the best bodies of data are going to come eventually from studying the hundreds of millions of people in the world who take up vaping. And so we will ask whether vapors get less Parkinson's disease. At least we'll know it's nicotine. How about using nicotine patches? Nicotine itself, and in fact, there is a clinical trial underway for Parkinson's patients given nicotine patches. Uh, I claim that clinical trial is poorly conceived. Nicotine itself is a very good addictive drug, but it's not a very good um, therapeutic drug because it affects lots of different nicotinic receptors and because many people can't tolerate nicotine. Drug companies know this. They're trying to make nicotine derivatives. So what is the basis for nicotine's protection? How can it addict the upper lip but protect the handlebars? Uh, we have a paper in press in the Journal of Neuroscience suggesting that nicotine enhances the cellular defense pathway early on so that cells are better able to protect themselves against certain misfolded proteins and never get into the apoptotic arms of the pathway. We'll see whether that pans out. Uh, other therapeutic approaches, limiting neurotrophic hypothesis, you may remember well. And so the question is whether you can give neurons the right kind of growth factor to protect them. And the right kind of growth factor is GDNF, glial-derived neurotrophic factor. Uh, unfortunately, trials with GDNF failed. They were tried at Amgen first 25 years ago, and they did not work. And so then the question is, what about gene therapy? To put in cells that re re release GDNF, uh, there are some encouraging trials underway now. Let's see if that works. And then uh, there are other uh, gene therapy approaches that actually convert the subthalamic nucleus, one of the excitatory nuclei, to be more negative, which ought to interrupt that feedback loop and those tremors. And those trials are underway now by using an adeno-associated virus to make these guys um, inhibitory. Lots of stories to tell. I can't be, unfortunately, at office hours today. but And I will not be here next week. But if you want to know more, email me. And have a good weekend and a happy Thanksgiving.